Hello everybody and welcome to our presentation Construction Grammar, Literariness and the Limitation Continuum of AI. This is Matthias and I am Katharina. Let me tell you as an introduction the story behind our study as a prologue. I am dealing with the question how to approach to literariness scientifically for a long time. For this, I focus on estrangement as a characteristic of any entities of text, especially on the level of discourse and language. I use the concept of entropy to calculate the literary information content or the method of recurrence quantification analysis of literary entities of the text, of the text language to make literariness measurable. But in all, there's one limitation how to identify text units, chunks, as carriers of literariness. Sitting in a cafe in Budapest in February this year and pondering about the question and my contribution to this conference, I remembered Katharina. Her master thesis was an extraordinary work on construction grammar and systematic writing competence development. And so why I was electrified by the idea that construction grammar could solve my problems. But since I don't know anything about construction grammar, I started to post some WhatsApp messages to Katerina and the result of that is our presentation we will show you in this cast. So the question we will answer in the next 15 minutes is, are literary constructs on the level of discourse and text sufficient characteristics for literariness? A few words about literariness beforehand, but most will be familiar with it, I think. The premise is to cause estrangement or defamiliarization when perceiving literature. And there are three theoretical approaches to explain literariness. The first is related to a special kind of language use in texts. The second refers to a specific type of text which are marked as literary, and the third denotes to a specific mode of processing when reading literature. But these three principles do not stand side by side. They are integrated in the phenomenon of literariness, which could be imagined as a triangle. With one spot each on the reader's text knowledge, the experience and response when reading literary texts, and, at lastly, the author's competence when producing literature on the level of story and discourse, which leads us to construction grammar. Constructions can be more or less complex and specified. Let's have a look at their architecture. It is a dual architecture. It includes the level of form on the one hand and the level of meaning on the other hand, the deeper level. The first one is the expression, recognizable at the linguistic surface. The meaning level has a special function through which you act linguistically. This relates to the concept of text procedures, and text procedures, former called text routines, can also be seen as constructions. They are described mainly by Helmut Falke, or for example Sarah Riesert and Sabine Schmelzer-Eibinger. To connect these two approaches, construction grammar and text procedures, I deviate in some points from former schemes of constructions, as for example, proposed by Croft. I connected the levels closer to make clear they are inseparable and influence each other. By suggesting the term surface, I intended to concern the depth of the processing levels. This dual architecture has the potential to bring the unconscious into consciousness at the metalinguistic level. This relates also to the second and third principle of literariness Matthias introduced us before. The deeper level, which is related to the action, and the fact that both levels are embedded in a special context, points one more thing out that language is a tool for participation in cultural practices. 
And that's also the reason why I call it an architecture of constructions. This dual architecture has the potential to bring the unconscious to consciousness. In my research and practical work, I use this for didactic interventions. And it can also be transferred to make a coding guide of it. And this is exactly what we did for our study. Let's have a look at the design of our study. It follows an explorative approach. We used mixed methods, both qualitative and quantitative, as well as inductive and deductive, which are finally triangulated. The qualitative content analysis refers to three poems by different producers. First, an established author, Rainer Maria Rilke, with his poem, The Panther. The second text was AI produced. And the third poem, Upwind, was written by me and first performed this year. I was honored of being invited to perform it at an interdisciplinary literary exhibition in Munich, where the audience was also involved and their perception of the reception was asked. We secured the insights from this interactive kind of publication and they assessed my actual intention in the text through a narrative interview. For our questionnaire, we segmented three constructions from each of the poems, using scale questions to implicitly target both the suitability as indicators of literariness and the subjectively perceived entrenchment. In addition, explicit questions asked about the subjective perception of literariness. Subsequently, the three poems were presented in their entirety and were asked for a rating of the literary quality. And finally, linguistic biographical data was collected. To evaluate the texts, we used the coding guide I've mentioned before. Of course, this is not to be regarded as fully comprehensive and has to be seen as a suggestion. But here you can see our suggested categories. First, inducing ambiguity. Second, inducing empathy. Third, inducing synesthetical perception, inducing emotion, reorganization of the meaning level of constructions, and to neologize. This also helped us creating the items of the questionnaire. And special about the categories is that their definition is not purely related to textual features or characteristics, but also includes the perception by recipients, which was raised by the questionnaire. With this duality of constructions, it becomes possible to consider the two dimensions of text and recipient. For this purpose, we've also used the RASH model for competence measurement, which also takes the two factors into account. One as the ability of a person to solve a specific task, the other as the objective difficulty of the task. In our approach, we consider the processing of the constructs as a problem to be solved, which is to experience the literariness of the texts. Before demonstrating our results, I will come back to the questionnaire. Here you can see a screenshot of a construct and how we get our data. Participants are given it to read and then use the slider to rate the five items on a scale of zero to 100. These five items ask about the common use of the phrase, its frequency of use, access to the scene, ambiguity and its literariness. Now our results. The box plot shows the distribution of the rates for the three constructs of each text. For this purpose, the mean value was calculated from the five items of each scale. Here we see a rather uneven picture. This means each construct is seen as a carrier of literariness. This seems to be independent of both the other constructs and the texts. 
This slide compares the mean score of the text with the average score of the constructs of the text. We shifted the scale, so now the values lie on a scale from minus 50 to 50, indicating non-literate and literate values left and right of zero respectively. It is remarkable that in the poem Panta the evaluation of the text outweighs that the constructs, which is not the case with the other two texts. The poem Die Brücke der Angst generated by JetGPT is rated very weakly. Now for the evaluation according to the Rush model. It is based on the fact that the test result is always composed of the ability of the test person and the difficulty of the task. In our case, the tasks are the constructs or texts and the skill refers to the reception of literature. The difficulty parameter of the construct or text can be calculated from the data and mapped in an item characteristic curve, which you show here. We interpret this parameter as the effort that someone has to make to perceive the literacy in the respective entities. The illustration gives an impression of the characteristics of our constructs. The respective effort is listed in the table next to it. One can see that no pattern related to the specific text can be discerned. The constructs seem to be independent from the text as well as from each other, and they also seem to pick areas of literariness. The characteristic curves for the text are shown on this slide. For the purpose of clarity, we do not present them together with the constructs. However, if you look at the values for the effort, you will see that they are higher for the text than for the single constructs. In the last graph, we compare the literariness of the text with the average literariness of the constructs of each text. The literariness measure was calculated from the effort value. We can see that the constructs themselves contain more potential of literariness than the poems. We should discuss this, for which I hand over to Katharina again. So let's have a closer look to some of the constructions we used for our questionnaire. Here we'll get a first insight into the macro structure of the poems. We have deliberately presented the texts very small, so because it's quite sufficient if you concentrate on the visual comparison. As you can see on the left, Rilke used a very conventionalized structure. Upwind in the middle is written in a free form. It's unconventionalized, and by that reason we expected that it was more difficult to recite. The right text is produced by ChatGPT. At first glance, it seems like a classical poem. But a closer look reveals that the processed rule for producing rhymes make it difficult to find meaningfulness. It is also striking that the poem has no title. In Rilke's poem, the title contributes significantly to understanding and the subtitle to describing the situation. In Upwind, the title is even integrated into the poem and typographically emphasized and set in relation to another central word, via font. Let's have a closer look to the constructions itself now. The presentation of the examples in German is retained in order to prevent distortions through translation. So, therefore, we concentrate on the level of meaning on the constructions. Rilke works here with several stylistic devices. Among other things, the effect is achieved that the eyelid of the panther, his body, functions automatically like an object. The image of the surroundings, on the other hand, is alive actively moving. Inside the panther, on the other hand, the physical tension becomes synesthetical tangible via the image of the tense stillness of the limbs, which is based on essential human experience. Upwind also refers to the concept of silence. Here, however, it sounds and breaks into a thousand voices, just as light can break indications of the intended meaning in the ambiguous phrases are given through essential human experience and participation in the cultural community, like in the panther. ChatGPT's poem appears rather clear than ambiguous. 
recognizable, for example, by a very superficial object description of a bridge. The used terms are just narrow, steep and cold. Some words seem to be used purely for rhyming purposes. They initially seem to have no connection to the content and are hardly common. For example, the word file, which is very unconventionalized and can mean for sale. It breaks out of the series of preceding adjectives to describe the bridge. The word grit only occurs in German as a first name. It's also unconventionalized. JetGPT describes it, or her, as to be attained in the end when one has overcome the bridge of fear. Overcoming fear as a metaphor for venal love in order to experience real love seems to be the only conceivable interpretive approach. The perceived low level of ambiguity is supported by the results of the questionnaire. On this slide, we compare the items access to scene and ambiguity by mean of all constructs of each poem. As one can see, access to scene is high rated by JetGPT's Brücke der Angst and low in both Aufwind and Der Panther. But in contrast, ambiguity in Die Brücke der Angst is low. Constructs taken out from Aufwind show a high degree of ambiguity and a low access to scene. The Panther has low involvement in the scene as well as ambiguity. Is there a pattern in this data? I claim, access to scene or involvement in the story causes tension and pleasure of reading. This is what we find conventional to literature and therefore is common to literary language. For a fast perception in the story, no ambiguity should be in the language, which is also conventional to literary speech. This is exactly what our data here suggests, which again looks to me that we can distinguish common literary language from uncommon literary language. Let's have a look at our conclusions, the points to discuss and an outlook. The initial results can be further deepened and discussed on many levels. They indicate low effort to perceive literariness reflects a higher level of literariness. The second thing is that a lower level of literariness reflects an easier assess. And literary constructions play a role in the identification and evaluation of literary texts. They can be identified on the literary surface. So our new thesis is that higher ambiguity increases the chance for identification and emotional involvement. What leads us to the outlook? What can be done in the future? One thing is significance testing. Or exactly testing what we mentioned in the feathers. Testing the experience of emotional involvement through texts. Another point would be expert assessments to further specify literary constructions. Or, and this is an important thing in our eyes, observing the development of AI-produced texts. The limitation continuum, we also mentioned in the title of our presentation, can be seen in our view as this three-dimensional animation shows. We don't know the whole black box of AI, but it is possible to identify its limitations. Examples for this are coherence, the lack of expression of authentic sensual experience, participation in the cultural community, or inducing emotions. For an artist and its audience, it's neither necessary nor desirable to rate any kind of art. But the scientist's approach to explore art by description, analysis and comparison could be helpful to become aware of development. This will be needed, in our view, in a time where processes become as fast as it is possible with AI. Because we need to know how close the imitation of human activity comes to humanity. To be able to recognize the various possibilities of manipulation 
to ask the currently important ethical and moral questions, to be aware and care about the essence of humanity. And for that reason, I want to end with a quote from T.S. Eliot. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Thank you for your attention and we hope you enjoy our story about literariness, construction grammar and artificial intelligence. Bye bye. Bye for now.